can short start uh, sharing your screen. Yeah, that's what I'm uh, Full screen, yeah. Uh, so we cannot see your uh, presentation yet. So you, you have to <laughs> yeah, uh, click on yeah. the button, uh, share screen, uh, and then uh, either yes. uh, share your screen or share your presentation. Okay. I don't know why it's not sharing. It tells me that share, there's a problem with sharing. Maybe you have to do something. Um, no, I think uh, all the all the speakers should be allowed to share the screen. Uh, yeah. Okay. Do, do you see any message here? Like some kind of. It just told me that it failed. Let me see. Let me now see again. Okay. okay. Now we can see. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, now Great. the problem is not full screen. Let me unshare and uh, I, there is some sequence I have to do, which I never understand, but <laughs> I think there is something that I can do. Uh, sorry, full screen. Uh, so do you see it now? No. I don't see anything. Okay. You have to uh, share again yeah. your screen. But we cannot see your presentation. Yeah, no, yet. no, I know that you cannot see, yeah, because okay. I'm not. <laughs> Sorry, this is crazy. Thanks. Okay, now I share. But yes. if, this is not full screen, right? No, That's but you, you can do it uh, uh, now. If you, um, try to press uh, F11 from your uh, keyboard. Or, uh, yes, you can also go to full screen mode there. Do you see full um, screen? No. No, okay. Let me. Um, yeah, usually laptop this, uh, with the Apple, these things happen. Ziran, you knew how to do okay. it. Okay. Yeah, no, I think it should work now. Okay. okay. Yes. Now it should see full screen. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so and now. You see slides moving? Yeah. Yes. You see slides yes. moving? Okay, very good. Yes, okay. perfect. Okay, so okay. first uh, uh, speaker for uh, this session is uh, Giaf Bani from uh, El uh, Munich, and uh, he will talk about. Yeah, uh, classicalization and the saturons. Yeah, that's right. So I'm going to talk about um, classicalization and saturons. Um, I'll explain what is it, what is this. Uh, okay. So first of all, yes, uh, I want to thank our organizers. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to give this talk. Um, and and um, so we'll be based on some papers, uh, probably mostly on on this on the recent most recent ones, but the old. Uh, there are also old ideas, uh, the original ideas with, with Jan Judice and Cesar Gomez and Alex Gehagi yes, the, the, the original idea. So, um, so it's about um, ultraviolet completion. Uh, um, so normally, um, so there is one way of, of complete, UV completing theories. I mean, quantum field theories, they are, they are all about degrees of freedom, right? And they, these degrees of freedom are good degrees of freedom when they are weakly interacting. This means that there is always a domain in which we're trying to, uh, I mean, the, to find good degrees of freedom, which uh, in which uh, Hamiltonian is uh, approximately diagonal. Uh, for example, um, and, and this is a scale dependent statement. So for example, here is, there, there's a theory with, with some degrees of freedom X. And th these degrees of freedom X, they have some coupling uh, alpha, so alpha generically will, will denote coupling in, in this talk, which depends on momentum transfer Q, okay? And um, so usually this is pretty standard and degrees of freedom, they, they go out of domain of weak coupling and they hit the certain boundary of this domain and they become strongly coupled. Um, so here, let's assume that this happens in this theory. So the degrees of freedom X, they become strongly interacting at some scale lambda. So the, the, the coupling uh, alpha becomes strong, strong above the scale, okay? And there is one way of UV completing the theory. So UV completion means that we now have to find good degrees of freedom, which are again weakly interacting. And there is one well-known way of UV completing theory, which I call Wilsonian. Uh, which is about integrating in some new degrees of freedom. Uh, so this degree of freedom is Y, okay? Yeah. 
Now, it may happen that your old degrees of freedom, X is they stay, simply continue, or it may happen that you have to replace all of those old degrees of freedom by new degrees of freedom. So you, you replace X is by Y. For example, the, the, a good example is the standard model, Higgs in the standard model. So in standard model, um, scattering of longitudinal W bosons becomes strong, longitudinal W bosons, they become strongly interacting above certain scale of few hundred uh, GeV. And um, so we have to integrate in a, a, a Higgs particle. So this is what Higgs particle does. Uh, so we integrate in Higgs particle, we restore unitarity all, even perturbatively, and then we continue. Okay, and this is pretty standard in this Wilsonian theories. Now the UE completion that I want to discuss today is a new concept and we call it classicalization. So UE completion by classicalization or sometimes we call it self-completion. And so what is the idea? Now the idea is that instead of integrating in new degrees of freedom, uh, theory can find uh, resources within itself for self-unitarizing uh, unitarizing itself by using the old degrees of freedom, okay? So how this happens? So what happens in this class of theories is that instead of you completing theory by integrating in new weakly interacting degrees of freedom, so the theory unitarizes using high occupation number states of multi-particle states of soft degrees of freedom, but the same degrees of freedom. So the same fields as we have in low energies, okay? So, um, so the, what, what happens is this sort of theory fools the nature in this way, thinking the following way. So you do scattering above scale lambda, way above scale lambda. So you have center of mass energy way exceeding your strong coupling. So if theory would do two to two scattering, it would of course violate unitarity, at least perturbatively. But instead what theory does, it redistributes this huge uh, center of mass energy within many soft quanta, large occupation number of soft quanta. So in this way, the effective coupling in each vertex is weak, okay? And so we have a perfectly weakly interacting situation. Now, um, of course, in this type of theories, in this talk, I will be interested in asymptotic situation when the scattering amplitudes are way above the, the strong coupling scale. Um, of course, interesting things may happen around this scale. Now, for example, the role of uh, lambda in gravity is played by, by Planck scale. And um, um, for pions, it's played by QCD and so on, right? So the strong coupling scale. Now, um, uh, this, th this type of uh, uh, UV completion, uh, so is, uh, so what this type of UV completion does is the following thing that the theory uh, in deep UV that you thought that you were probing deep UV regime in, in, in reality becomes deep infrared regime, okay? Now, since this uh, high occupation number uh, state, soft quanta states are classical, in a good approximation, of course, in nature, there is no such thing as classicality. I will be working in quantum theory. Classicality is an emergent phenomena when we have high occupation number of quanta, then, then we treat uh, states approximately classically. And um, so this is the situation, the physics is here is very interesting, it's pretty unusual. So it's, it's physics of weak coupling, actually extreme weak coupling, uh, but strong field high occupation number. So high occupation number, we couple. Okay, so now the first question you can ask with this, about this type of UV completion is, uh, wait a minute, I mean, we know that in weekly, inter in weekly couple theories, uh, production of uh, high occupation number states, production of classical states must be exponentially suppressed, okay? And this is true, indeed, for example, it's, pretty well understood in renormalizable theories of scalars. The same is true in scattering of spin two particles. So each individual microstate that you produce in this scattering process is exponentially suppressed. No question about that. 
However, what is the specifics of uh, classicalizing theories is that the state that you produce has maximal entropy. And so this maximal entropy overcompensates, actually compensates the uh, suppression, exponential suppression, which is characteristic, the characteristics of non-perturbative processes. Okay, so this is what happens. Now I call such objects saturons and it's clear that these saturons, they must have maximal entropy. They should have to saturate certain bound on entropy. And the question is which one? What is the, what, what is the entropy? What is the maximal entropy? Okay. Now let me introduce right away the concept of, concept of saturons, okay? Now the saturons are, so this, this is, doesn't have to be a system of gravity. It can be a generic system. Suppose you have a system in which you have certain occupation number of degrees of freedom, so certain constituents. It could be a baryon, for example, in QCD, large in QCD. So you have occupation number of uh, uh, particles of, of mode degrees of freedom, uh, which is N. So N will be occupation number. And there is some characteristic, characteristic coupling that by which they interact alpha. Okay, so now um, the saturons are states. There is a very important subclass of all possible systems of nature, which satisfy, which satisfy this, this, this equality. So the entropy is equal to occupation number and equals to one over alpha, okay? So at this point, it turns out that some, some very interesting things happen when the system is pushed towards this limit, okay? Uh, by the way, let me tell you preemptively that uh, black holes are particular sort of saturons. They are saturons. Now, the, the, the original entropy bound, and this is the, actually the bound that has been discussed so far, so far until recently, um, is so-called Bekenstein entropy bound, okay? Now, Bekenstein is, is, is telling us that um, if you have a system of certain localization radius R and energy E, the maximal entropy that this system can have is E times R. Okay, here there's also two pi, but it's not so important for, the, for this discussion. The, the scaling is important. So it's E times R. Okay, so now um, one thing you, can, you may notice as a quantum field theory person or a particle physics person, of course, this, this talk will be from the point of view particle, a uh, particle physicist, okay? someone thinking about this matrix and, and stuff. Uh, this bound doesn't contain information about coupling, okay? So it only contains information about energy and, 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 and localization radius. And, and they, that may be a little bit confusing because uh, naively it looks like you can, you can produce infinite number of counterexamples. And indeed you can, but there is some implicit knowledge of coupling, which will become uh, clear later. But in any case, I mean, if we simply take this bound without reference to the coupling, it looks like incomplete from the point of view of quantum field theory. Now you can ask this question, what, what are the objects that saturate this, this bound, this particular bound, entropy bound, okay? So, so far I'm discussing Bekenstein bound. And um, the, 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 the objects that were, were discussed so far in literature, at least I'm not aware of any other discussion until recently, are black holes. Okay, black holes and sometimes the sitter state, which is pretty similar to, to a black hole. Um, now black holes saturate the Genstein bound, but they, and they saturate it in a, in, a, in a very interesting way, manner. Um, you can see that if you take Begenstein Hawking entropy of a black hole and use the relation between area and between, sorry, the radius and the Schwarz radius and, and the energy, it, it indeed saturates Begenstein bound. But the entropy has a form of area. Now, of course, uh, area, you can, if you use proper units, you, you can always equate area to volume or whatever. But here, the important thing is that it is the area in the fundamental units of the fundamental scale, Planck scale. Okay, so L Planck is the Planck length. So G is Newton's constant. One over M Planck is M Planck, of course. And so this creates an impression that the black holes, it was the famous thing, this is well known, of course, uh, that, that uh, as if the information is stored on, 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 a, on a surface with some pixels, 
Okay, and there obviously this raises many questions. Is this storage, is this re real? Is this only bookkeeping or, or there is some physics behind this and so on, okay? Now, in order to understand, so my talk will be about understanding, part, part of my talk is about understanding of, it will emerge, the understanding of uh, particle physics meaning, so meaning of this from the scattering amplitudes in particular. Uh, but in order to understand, let's first try to understand what is Planck scale from the particle physics point of view. And, and Planck scale from the particle physics point of view is a coupling constant, is a coupling, okay? It's a decay constant of, of a graviton. And um, um, the graviton graviton coupling, uh, quantum coupling of gravitons is, is given by momentum transfer uh, square divided by M Planck square. By the way, here I'm treating quantum gravity as an effective theory of quantum, low energy theory of quantum gravity. And this, what I will say, will be applicable to arbitrary theory of quantum gravity that in infrared flows to Einstein theory of quantum gravity. Okay. Uh, so I, in this sense, I will not distinguish the story around the cutoff. I will not distinguish between quantum gravity and string, string theory. Whatever I will say also will be true for string theory. Okay. Um, okay. So therefore, if, if now here comes something interesting that if you, if you stare at this uh, quantum coupling of graviton, the first thing that's interesting is that if I have gravitons of wavelength R, okay, th their quantum coupling scales is area, okay? This, uh, and actually it scales as inverse entropy of a black hole. As you can see very, very, very easily. And that's a fact of nature. And there's no, no, there's no assumption here or anything like that. I'm just making an observation. Surprisingly, this was never pointed out previously, okay, before we, we started to, to look for this. I, at least I have not seen this statement in, in the literature. It's very interesting if anyone has noticed it. So the, the thing is that we say that black hole entropy scales like um, area, but we could have with equal success said that black hole entropy scales like one divided by the graviton coupling. And that, would, that is true. Okay, so here's what I, what is written. So the fact of nature is that black hole entropy scales as graviton graviton coupling evaluated of course at the scale of the, of the size of the system. And in simultaneously of course it, it is area because inverse graviton coupling is an area. That is true in arbitrary number of dimensions. Now, the second thing is that um, I could have said, of course, I'm saying that this is area in Planck units, but with equal success, I could have said that black hole entropy is an area in the units of a Goldstone decay constant. What Goldstone? Black hole is a, breaks Poincare invariance spontaneously. And um, there's the corresponding Goldstone boson. This Goldstone boson of breaking is also graviton itself. And therefore I could have said that black hole entropy is an area in units of a decay constant of a Goldstone boson or broken Poincare symmetry. That again would be a fact. I mean, just, this is just a fact of nature. Okay, so now I want to relate this to unitarity. So what's the connection with unitarity of all this story, okay? Now, um, now we know that uh, black holes should be produced in, 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 in arbitrary uh, high energy scattering process, okay? Very high transplantian scattering process. And it doesn't matter uh, from where the energy comes. The energy may come from two, two particles. For example, I can have two gravitons with humongous center of mass energy or E plus E minus. And once they reach, uh, well, once this energy is localized within the, Schwar the Schwarzschild radius of center of mass energy, I have to form a black hole. This some already semi-classical intuition is telling you that. And this idea is not, is not new uh, from 80s. This is discussed and th there are many papers on this. Now, what is new, what then was, was, was not appreciated at the time is the relation to, of this scattering amplitude, the, my, the my, uh, microscopic meaning of the scattering amplitude in terms of multi-graviton states, okay? And this, this is very important for classicalization. In other words, the new point is in understanding of uh, scattering of two gravitons of transplankian uh, center of mass energy into high occupation number of soft gravitons. 
Now it turns out, um, so we did this computation. Uh, actually it was, uh, again, the same story uh, was not really done in the literature. So 2-2-N graviton in this, uh, with this, in this kinematic regime. And this was done relatively recently by two groups, by our group and by uh, Adazi Bianchi and Veneziano. Um, now we did this computation in, in, in two ways, uh, in two ways and each way we did it with two methods, uh, even three, you can say. So it's a non-perturbative computation of uh, amplitude, uh, both in uh, effective quantum field theory of gravity and in fully fledged string theory. So string theory is out, since we are working in large N, um, gives the same, same result as quantum field theory, theory computation, as long as the, the wavelengths of the uh, final state gravitons are longer than the string length. At shorter distances, there are corrections. But here I'm looking at, at, my, my, at, at macroscopic, uh, macroscopic black holes, hypothesis. So I'm not making any assumption. I'm not making any assumption that what I should get should be a black hole. I'm just trying to sit down and compute uh, as, as accurately as we can, um, two to n graviton scattering amplitude in the kinematic regime that is under control. Of course, in quantum field theory, there is no such thing as absolute computation. We always compute where we can. And when we compute, then we compare results to what we know. And this is what we're doing here. And this computation is, can be done cleanly, okay? And um, the result is uh, extremely interesting. So here's the cross-section. Cro this is the way cross-section scales. Actually, what is interesting here is that because of this uh, power of large N limit, the, the pre-factor doesn't matter. You can understand this immediately why it doesn't matter. The, the, the cross-section is, is measured in units of R, of course. Pre-factor doesn't matter because I'm looking at the saturation of unitarity and saturation of unitarity is governed by exponential part and the pre-factor only corrects it by alpha, the width of saturation, the saturation of the entropy of the final state where the entropy of the final state saturates the, the, the unitarity of this amplitude. And you, as you can see, so, so in large N, this becomes exact. This is exact, literally, the saturation point is one over alpha. In, 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 limit of, in, in limit of alpha going to zero, which is the same as N going to infinity. And finally, then well, there'll be corrections, one, one over N, but they are negligible. For example, for, for, for a mass of a black hole of solar mass, the correction would be 10 to the minus 77 or something like that. You can forget about it, okay? Now this, so this, therefore this tells us that um, the, 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 the entropy, indeed unitarity is, is, is correlated with saturation of unitarity by multi-particle scattering amplitudes. And entropy comes out to be exactly the, the black hole entropy, precisely, without any, any, any assumption about black hole. I never assumed anything about black hole, okay, here. Of course, this, this cries for uh, to say that, aha, uh -huh, Black holes probably are well described as multi graviton, multi soft graviton states. At least bulk of black hole physics is, is, is well described by this. Uh, so, this is a microscopic theory of a black hole, uh, which, uh, which again, if you make this assumption, the black hole is, is a multi soft graviton state, it comes out again to be a saturated state, completely independent from the amplitude. So, you see that the two things match again. Um, so, now I will not push further this, this, this uh, macroscopic picture, but again, I want to ma make it very clear that the amplitude story is completely independent about the assumption of microscopic theory. Now, when we have a phenomenon of nature in general, right? So, and we, and we want to understand this phenomena. What, what do we do? There are two methods. One is we create a microscopic theory of this phenomena. For example, if I have a bucket of, bucket of water and water evaporates, and I don't, I, I don't know why this happens. I try to come up with a microscopic theory of water. I say, okay, it must be made of molecules. Let me now go ahead and compute and see whether this theory really gives evaporation. But second, second way, this is, this, this is going into in direction of microscopic theory. For example, suggesting the black hole is a um, uh, high occupation number state of soft carbons and then see what happens. 
there is an alternative way of trying to understand what is happening by trying to see, look for the same phenomena or in different other, other systems of nature. For example, if a if bucket of water evaporates and I don't know what water is, instead of, instead of trying to come up with a microscopic theory of water, instead I can ask myself, are there other systems that also evaporate, for example? And then I will discover that there are plenty of liquids and they, and they behave like water. Okay, and then immediately I conclude, aha, this particular property of evaporation has nothing to do with water. It's a generic property of those systems. And let me try to understand what is the characteristics shared by those systems. This is the second route. And now, now I'm taking this, switching gears to that one, okay? Now, what the question I want to ask, are black holes unique in these properties? In other words, are the black holes the only saturons in nature that they have entropy one over alpha, which scales like area, okay? And they saturate unitarity. Now, it, it's, it's, it's really surprising because this question could have been asked 40 years ago. And again, I, I'm not aware of any, any discussion of this in the literature because normally we say that black holes are very special. Of course, we understand that black holes are very special. For example, we understand that black hole is, is a state in gravity is way more special than a chair in a, in a standard model. A chair is a, is a state in the standard model, okay? Non-gravitational bound state. But, but that's a meaningless uh, statement because that's like comparing apples with oranges. The right question that should have been asked is, if I take chair and I push it towards saturation point of unitarity, it, does it behave like a black hole? In non-gravitational theory, this is, my, this is the question, okay? And uh, this is what, we, what I have discovered. So I went through the list in, in the, those three, three papers uh, from last year or the, and the year before. So I asked this question literally. I mean, uh, and I, I went, went through the list of these states in non-gravitational quantum field theory. It's very normalizable, okay? Um, every state has the same behavior as a black hole. But once you push a state towards saturation, you see that it behaves literally like a black hole. No, no difference. I could not detect any difference, okay? And um, so here's the point. So, and this is true for solitons, baryons, instantons, I mean, simply lumps of the classical fields, etc. cetera, uh, you name it. Now, what are the properties that they share? So all the objects that once you push them towards saturation point, okay? They share, share the same property. So their entropy becomes area law in the exactly like black hole entropy in the units of the decay constant of corresponding Ohm boson, always, okay? Because they always break translate, they always break, break concrete symmetries, these the, the, the states, okay? Uh, their entropy simultaneously is inverse coupling, okay? Of course, this is running coupling evaluated, a scale dependent coupling evaluated at the scale R. By the way, notice that for goldstone and for any coupling, actually this coupling has a property that at the saturation point, it also equals to the area of the system in, in the units of goldstone boson. They just, again, this is a fact of nature. You can check for different states and different randomizable quantum field theories, uh, and you will not find a counter example. It's always true, okay? And finally, um, these uh, states, they uh, are in correlation. Again, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between um, saturation by these states and the saturation of the unitarity bound in 2,2 n scattering amplitudes, where n is at the point of one over alpha, which is point of actually optimal truncation. Now, the, this saturation of unitarity is, is fully non-perturbative, okay? You cannot remove it by resummation or anything like that because it comes from the enhancement of the cross-section uh, by the entropy factor. It's not coming from the multiplicity of Feynman diagrams. We know that there is a standard issue with multiplicity of the Feynman diagrams growing factorially, no. Because here we, I'm working at the, at the point of optimal truncation. So the, where the, the that, that factorial growth is not there, okay? And uh, so this is enhancement by the entropy factor. And all the time we find exactly the same thing as, as, as for a black hole, okay? Over and over again. So in other words, what I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proposing, so what I see that there is an in, completely independent, com, com, completely independently arrived entropy bound 
of, of any quantum field theoretic system, which is given by the one over alpha coupling. Okay, so in other words, quantum field theoretic system, entropy of a quantum field theoretic system, it, 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 what, what I'm observing is it cannot exceed one over alpha. This is the absolute bound. Otherwise, it would violate unitarity, non perturbatively. Okay, let me give an example. Uh, I, I think I still have five minutes or something, right? Or, or seven? Uh, two minutes. But you oh, two minutes. Have, okay. Yes. Let me let Just me do go it. towards uh, conclusions. Uh, no problem. Even one minute is fine. <laughs> okay. So let me give you one example. This is sort of cool because this again shows. Uh, I, I, if I hear, if I heard correctly in the discussion, Bob asked this question about QCT, about gluons and and, and gravitons, and here this is exactly what what I'm observing is that the, the scattering of gluons has some very close similarity at the saturation point with the, with the scattering of gravitons. And um, so here, here I'm working in large NQCD, SUN gauge theory of pure glue. And um, so N is large, the number of colors is large, and uh, there is QCD coupling, which is alpha QCD. And then we can define so-called toast coupling, alpha times N, okay? And there is this nice limit in which we can take alpha to zero and to infinity uh, and keep uh, toft coupling finite. So in this, in this way, the, the, the running coupling is a toft, is toft coupling. And so in this limit, uh, toft coupling is finite and also QCD scale is finite. And, and QCD scale is around the scale. So in, in, this theory is pretty well understood. So we know that the confines around QCD, QCD scale and QCD scale is around where toft coupling becomes strong. Okay, the toft coupling becomes sort of one. So asymptotic states are colorless. Now there is something very interesting here, okay? The very interesting correlation with the saturation point because let's ask this question, what would happen uh, in QCD, in large QCD, if uh, QCD would not confine, okay? Now imagine for a moment that QCD doesn't confine by some mysterious reason, okay? So therefore, uh, now then an observer, this is Alice, an observer, so observer can, Alice can do scattering experiments with gluons um, at the scale, which is of course smaller than the confinement scale because confinement scale, non-confining means that confinement scale is very la much larger than the scale of your experiment. And we discovered the following thing that if the, the multi-gluon amplitudes, uh, again, saturate unitarity be, they become saturons, basically, multi-gluon states uh, around, the criti around certain critical point where toft coupling is of order one. So this is precisely the point where we know the theory confines, but you see this now sheds a very different light on this confinement. Because what happens is that uh, the, the, color, the, the, the color entropy of the gluon state would, would violate this one over alpha bound, okay? Uh, so theory has to do something. Okay, so the theory, because the, for large stops coupling, the, the cross section non perturbatively would grow, and this is impossible. And so, what theory does, but of course, theory is consistent. So, what theory does is it, it, it responds by generating a mass gap. Uh, now, in pure blue, the only possibility to only known mechanism for generating mass gap is confinement. So, therefore, theory confines. And there is a very, very, very nice correlation with gravity. So, you see what, what, what we are observing. So, we're observing that in two, in two graviton scattering, Okay, in two graviton, graviton, graviton scattering, the, the black holes are formed in order to prevent violation of unitarity. So multi, multi graviton states are formed with entropy. Now, if you try to put even more energy, the, the, the number of this soft quanta will grow, which classically means that I will produce a bigger black hole. Uh, QCD responds by confinement. So essentially confinement effectively in this way, in this picture, you can think of confinement as the as the preventive mechanism for violating the central bound. But also we see that there is a similar one-to-one -to -one correspondence between the seemingly completely un unrelated theories through saturation. In any case, I mean, the theory, uh, I, to, to conclude, this, let, me, let me say this is last transparency. Um, so theory can unitarize by saturons. If theory has a continuum, spe continuum spectrum of saturon about certain scale. Okay, and then, so it's, a, it's like a fixed point. 
So it's like a, in black holes, they offer that, gravity offers that because black, this alpha n equals one is a fixed point, okay, for, uh, for gravity. And so the theory that can offer this will, will, will unitarize through classicalization, okay? So the continuous spectrum of gravity, such ones. Okay, let me go to conclusion. Since I don't have time. Um, okay, so the conclusions are more or less, uh, this is what I wanted to, these are the messages I wanted to convey, that um, the, this, the saturons, they behave similarly in all the theories, gravitational, non-gravitational, doesn't matter. They exhibit, exhibit all these properties, the area low entropy, one over alpha, et cetera. And there is a correlation between 2 to n graviton scattering amplitudes. And, um, um, so this, this, this true, there is a long list of uh, explicit examples that, uh, that is there and uh, there is no counter example to this because of good reason. I mean, and then confinement could be viewed as sort of counterpart of black hole formation in gravity from this point of view of saturation. And um, so in randomizable theories, we have saturations, and UV completion requires alpha n equals one. Um, now, of course, there are all, all, all other interesting questions about uh, BSM, physics beyond the standard model, which exhibits this type of saturation, uh, Higgs mass stabilization of the Higgs mass by classicalization, and uh, tau saturon tower, it, uh, if we can produce them at accelerators, if there is such a beyond the standard model theory, et cetera, et cetera. But let me finish here. Thank you very much for uh, listening to this talk. <laughs> Thanks, Gia, for this very interesting talk. Um, okay, so I, I see that there are several uh, uh, questions. So the first one was by um, Anupam. So you mute yourself. Uh, thanks, Gia, for this lovely talk. I, I, I think I absolutely agree with what you said. Um, but you. one thing, um, perhaps uh, you would also realize that the only, I mean, in quantum theory, the only entropy is the entanglement entropy. Now the question is, how would you relate this entropy to entanglement entropy? Um, yeah, th thanks for asking this question. Actually, here the the the, the entropy that I'm, I was referring to is complete is unambiguous. This is simply log out of the gen out of number of the degenerate states. Okay. Now, if you compute the entanglement entropy of that, you will get exactly the same 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 answer as you would get in the entanglement entropy. But so I deliberately didn't mention entanglement entropy because I want to stay in a very well defined pure state counting context. context. So I'm counting the number of degenerate microstates, literally. Okay. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks. But the, the um, two, of course, agree at the end of the day. Yeah. Next, there is a question by Alessandro. Hi. Uh, so, hi. if hi, yeah, if uh, I go back to the four derivative theory discussed by previous speakers, uh, and I compute the scatterings above the Planck energy, I find that enhanced uh, infrared uh, divergences uh, prevent uh, scatterings above the Planck energy. Is this a kind of uh, you know, classicalization? Uh, I, I think it is in, in a sense, yeah. I mean, I, um, I, 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 I hear your, your question and I think that, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Now, the, of course, uh, here of, I was assuming that I'm working in a ghost-free theory. So in other words, I'm manifestly assuming only positive energies in the theory and the, all the particles are only, only of positive energy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because of several reasons, which I mean, I, I, I can expand into, but but um, because th this, is, this is the only theory that I can consistently compute things in with the methods that I know. Uh, so that's the reason. Now, the question that you're asking is what happens? Is, can some of this survive uh, if we generalize theory to the theory with, uh, for example, states in which some of those have negative energies, okay? Now, one thing that you get in, the, in that theory, if states have negative energies, you, you can see that immediately you can violate uh, the, uh, Bekenstein bound on entropy, okay? Now, the interesting question is, and I didn't study that, whether you will also violate one of our alpha entropy bound. Because in uh, what I'm observing is the following, that in all the uh, theories with positive, positive energy states, 
whenever theory, so the Bekenstein bound is very different from one over alpha bound. You can have states, for example, which satisfy Bekenstein but violate one over alpha bound, and therefore they are excluded by unitarity. But if, the, if you take into account consistently all the corrections and everything, typically what happens is that at the saturation of the one over alpha bound, you also saturate Bekenstein bound. So it looks like they are saturated simultaneously. Uh, now, uh, the, the, um, uh, so the question is, would this continue to be true if I allow in my, my theory states with non-positive energy? Uh, so I don't know the answer to the question because for, for sure Bekenstein bound will be violated. That's for sure because, because uh, that's obvious because if you have negative energy particle, you can combine it with positive energy particle and you can put as, many, as much information as you want without any energy expense. Uh, so for sure Bekenstein bound will be violated. But one over alpha, I don't know. So that's an interesting question. Now, uh, on the second part of your question, that what you are saying is that you produce many, many, many soft quanta. Uh, yeah, that that is. A, I would call it a, 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 a classicalization. Yes, that's right. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Next, there is a question by Alberto. Uh, I wanted to ask you the following question. So as far as I understand, uh, this classicalization uh, happens uh, for energies above the Planck mass, right? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm higher is the better. So I'm, 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 I'm working asymptotically at uh, arbitrarily yeah. high energies. Right? High energies. So um, how do you uh, say match this classicalization regime with uh, the regime in which gravity is weak uh, perturbative, but still non renormalizable. So, if you go below the Planck scale, uh, th th there is, uh, yeah, if I understood the question correctly, I mean, there is perfect matching there because this computation, as I said, th these computations that we did with this, uh, these two groups, uh, uh, this is done uh, in fully fledged, uh, I mean, normal gravity, sorry, yeah. The, this, these computations are done in normal gravity. Uh, so the, the, of course, gravity here is non-renormalizable. So, but uh, that is not precluding us from the, this computation. Actually, um, actually you can do this. Uh, I mean, you can understand quali this qualitatively very well because uh, for example, if I integrate out, imagine that I integrate out uh, some physics at the Planck scale and write, I write down some effective high derivative contributions, okay? What happens mm -hmm. is that for momentum transfer, uh, so what, what, since theory classicalizes at high certain mass energy, the wavelengths of the gravitons in which it, 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 it goes are larger and larger. So correspondingly, the, the effective momentum transfer is, it goes to zero, okay? For infinite n, it goes to zero. Correspondingly, high derivative corrections, they are high order in one over n. So they are completely negligible. So for, for, any micro, for any macroscopic black hole formation, uh, high, high derivatives, they do not contribute anything to this process. They are, they are one over n, higher, higher powers of one over n suppressed. So that's the way you can understand qualitatively why they don't, they don't contribute. But the, as I said, I mean, this computation is fully non-perturbative. We did it in fully fledged string theory as, 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 one, as a consistency check. So of course, string theory takes care of this automatically, obviously. Uh, and yeah, indeed, you, you see that that's the, that's the case. But, but the, the, the answer to your question is that for classicalizing theories at very high center of mass energies, physics around Planck scale is less and less important, okay? Because the momentum transfer is dominated by very low momenta. So the, theory prevents itself because of this entropy. You see what happens is, uh, probably this is another intuitive way to understand this. Because he, he, think in the following way, I have uh, two, let's say I prepare some initial state of two extremely energetic gravitons, okay? So I boost gravitons to galactic mass or something, okay? And now I have this, uh, I have this process. Now, what I know non-perturbatively is that uh, once I compute Schwarzschild of this center of mass energy, I know that the saturon is the state that has maximal entropy there. Okay, which means that all the microstates in which the system can be once, you, once the gravitons enter the sphere, okay, is already exhausted by saturon. So there is nothing else there to, to produce because the saturon covers everything. 
And so that's why it's so powerful because it immediately forces these gravitons the moment they enter. I mean, there's no moment of course, but the, the, what it forces, it forces to, to, to ultra soften uh, because of this, because of this enormous entropy enhancement, okay? Okay, so thanks, Diva, for uh, answering the, the questions. So since we are uh, running out of time, I, I would suggest that we uh, take the other questions during the discussion session, and uh, we now sure, thank yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sure. again for uh, the nice talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now 